What's going on guys, Exceptual here, and today I'm gonna be teaching you how to get started hacking Unity games. Oh. Hello guys, uh, uh, can I counter? Can I counter by finding Before we get into the video, I'll be talking about some of the concepts I'll be covering today. This video is targeted for people who are relatively new to game hacking, but understand the fundamentals like memory scanning, creating internal external hacks, pattern scanning, and creating an SDK. If you have no idea what you're doing, I recommend Kaz's video on how to learn game hacking, which offers a brief introduction on game hacking and getting started. With all that out the way, let's start talking about actually hacking Unity games. When Unity games are built, they use one of two scripting backends, Mono or IL to CPP. Some games like Escape from Tarkov use Mono, while others like Rust use IL to CPP. Depending on the game, you're going to have to change some of your game hacking techniques. I won't be covering mono in this video because there's an extra layer of complexity when it comes to game hacking due to some aspects like just-in-time compiling, which means that game functions only get compiled when they're used. Instead, I'll be focusing on games that use the IL to CPP backend because of the increasing amount of new games that use it. In this video, I'll be using Rust as an example, but most of my techniques will apply to other games. Now you may be wondering, what are backends? Scripting backends are the different types of compilers that Unity uses to translate C Sharp into a programming language the target platform, for example Windows or Mac OS, can use and understand. For IL to CPP, what this backend does is it takes your C Sharp code and converts it to C, allowing compatibility for more devices that support C. When this code is generated, information about basically everything like classes, offsets, images, and more is saved in a metadata file called globalmetadata.dat. We can use tools like IL to CPP Dumper or IL to CPP Inspector to extract the C-sharp DLLs and dump the information that they contain. In this example, I'll be using IL to CPP Dumper, but you can also try using IL to CPP Inspector. Install the latest version that works for you. Place IL to CPP Dumper on a drive you can easily access and make sure you launch IL to CPP Dumper. When it first opens, it should prompt you to provide both gameassembly.dll, which contains your game code, and global metadata, which contains the game data. Give it a second to dump, and once it finishes, you should see a folder called dummy.dll, which contains all of the original C Sharp DLLs used in your game. You also need to download a dot edit assembly. I recommend DNSpy to view the class information. Once you have all your DLLs, you want to put in assembly c sharpdll Most of the time, this DLL holds almost all the class information that you'll need when reversing the game. In order to search for information, you can use the search bar at the bottom. In this case, we'll be searching for base networkable. When you open a class for the first time, you'll notice that all the function data is stripped. If you want to find the code responsible for that function, you can either use the plugins generated by IL to CPP Dumper to help you search for it in your favorite disassembler like IDA, you can use the relative virtual address if your image base is set to zero, or you can just pass a virtual address and go straight to it. Now let's get to actually finding our local player. Um, there are multiple methods, but today we're just going to be using the entity list inside of base networkable because it's probably the easiest. If you scroll down, you'll see a field called client entities. And if you're observant, you'll notice that that field is static. To understand the difference between static and non-static fields, we have to talk about classes in IELTS CBP. I'll be going over the basics, but if you want to learn some more, I have a quick write-up on my blog in the description. Anyway, whenever a class is compiled from C sharp to C++, IELTS and CBP generates a class structure like the one you see on screen. These structures contain data like the DLL it's associated with, also called an image, the name of the class, events, properties, methods, and basically everything you need to know about the class, including fields. Here's base networkable and reclass. If you view the fields pointer, you'll see that it's the same layout as the one I provided side by side on the screen. Normal fields like these only contain the name and offset, which needs to be added to an actual instance of that class to get the memory value. On the other hand, Static fields don't require an actual instance of the class in memory. Their fields are set when IL to CPP is done initializing. This answers the question as to where our data, aka the entity list, is coming from. So far, our pointer chain is base networkable plus the static fields offset, so 0xb8. If we dereference that, we actually go inside the static fields array. Continuing down, we see that client entities is of type entity room, so let's go see what that is. By viewing entity realm, we see that 
entity list is actually an offset 0x0 and it's a type list dictionary. So back in read class, let's dereference the pointer at 0x0. Now we search the header file generated by the dumper, we'll find the structures that we need. When viewing the list dictionary, notice the specifier applied. Now I can't tell you exactly what it does, but I've realized while reversing that usually when the specifier is applied, that most of the data actually starts at um, 0x8 or 0x10. So if we use the example, key to IDX would start at 0x10. Another eight bytes would be 0x16 for IDX to key. Keys would be at 0x20, and the data that we need would be at 0x28. So continuing where we left off, uh, I'm not gonna lie, I got tired of voiceovering. So uh, once you're done, we should arrive at values, which should be at 0x28. Now, if we go back to DN spy, let's check what values actually is. So you can see values is a type buffer list. So Got to go back to header file and a search for buffer list. Just throw in buffer list and it should pop up. And uh, yeah, okay, this one, this one is fine. This doesn't matter because we're still gonna reverse it. But I'm gonna find the original one. Okay, so this is the original one. So you can see same alignment. So we're not gonna start from zero x zero because this is four bytes. So it's gonna be eight bytes of a buffer. Should I say? And usually count would be at 0xc, but of course it needs to be 8 by a line. So at 8, 8 plus 4 is equal to 12. Not 8 by a line yet, so plus 4, you get 16. So 0x10. And if we actually check, we'll see 0x10 is where it should pop up. And no 8 more bytes, we have the actual buffer, which is this array. So this is definition. So I already know that I will be object, this is 0x10. So it's gonna be 0x0, but the size is 0x10, which means that this next one is gonna be 0x10. We have the length, which is just a unit pointer, so it's this is 0x18. And then the actual um, array is gonna be at 0x20. If we check, no, we get the max. This is the max count. Of course, it's not over that count, so we're chilling, but it's a max length. So, you know, we check the data. It's an array of base number couples. So if we go back to our class, let's see. Go back to our class. And we will actually see. Let's look pretty bad name. 0x40. First entity in this array. Check the name. Succeed player pretty bad. Look at that, boys. Look at that. Alright, so wrote some code of my SDK. Um I tried to dumb it down by using offsets. So if you're wondering what this address is, um, well, it's the base of our pointer chain. We get this address from the type info. So it's gonna be in script.json when you dump your files. But in a city, you know, we're gonna run this code. It's gonna get the um, the address of the first index. And we're gonna read that to get our local player. So when we're using offsets, we follow that pointer chain. We get the first address in this data table. And you know, if I use my SDK that I know works, we should get the same address. Same address, check the output, same address. Now, this is my SDK. You can do this yourself by just adding um, 0x40 and then it's gonna be like a string structure. It's, it's gonna look something like this. You know, just print 0x14. But I use the SDK, because I'm different. I made it myself, I'll release a video on it soon. But if we print from our offsets, see we get the prefab and you know, do it for SDK, prefab, so basically it if you guys enjoyed this video i will make sure to have more content like this out it's my first time doing any of this i'm very tired it took me about two or three days just to make you know the animations but yeah if you really appreciate the content just you know leave a like comment if you want to talk to me about how to cpp or just need help in general i have my discord down in the description so i hope you guys have an amazing rest of your day peace out